Brain metastases are actually quite frequent in HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Up to 50% of patients eventually will develop brain metastases, and so it's a very high unmet clinical need in the HER2 positive world. We know our systemic treatments are quite effective from the neck down, but the brain does serve as a sanctuary. So I think as we've gotten better controlling HER2 positive disease for more time, more people end up with brain metastases, unfortunately. HER2 positive breast cancer is one of the breast cancers that where brain metastases are the most frequent. Up to 50% of people ultimately will develop brain metastases in the HER2 population. So this is not a rare subgroup. Triple negative uh, patients also develop brain metastases. Hormonally driven uh, breast cancer patients, it's more infrequent. Brain metastases universally is a very poor prognostic indicator. Patients with brain metastases often have to have brain radiation or some type of surgery to control these. Uh, the progression-free survival and unfortunately the overall survival of people with brain metastases is very poor when coming from a metastatic cancer. So it's very important for us to not only control disease in the rest of the body, but also to come up with effective agents to control brain metastases as well. So it's very interesting. We've seen a change in metastatic recurrence in HER2-positive disease. The new statistic is that 50% of our patients with metastatic HER2-driven breast cancer are now de novo disease, meaning they did not have early breast cancer, they just presented when they were metastatic. You kind of think, well, does that mean that metastatic patients are presenting later? In fact, it's not. What it actually represents is the fact that most patients that we get our hands on in the early stage setting, whether that's neoadjuvant or adjuvant, ultimately are cured. And so, the, therefore, more patients end up that are de novo. So the standard for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer in the first line setting really is chemotherapy in combination with trastuzumab and pertuzumab, or the so-called THP regimen. Our standard second line regimen really is TDM1, and historically in the third line and beyond, it's been quite open. There's not one regimen that we would consider our standard of care. Oftentimes, these are capecitabine containing regimens, capecitabine with the drug lapatinib, or capecitabine with trastuzumab. So patients do quite well with TDM1 for some time. That's traditionally our second line regimen. Most of the time patients receive our chemotherapy plus trastuzumab and pertuzumab in the first line setting. Uh, it, it varies, but a lot of people receive somewhere between six and eight cycles of chemotherapy in the first line setting, and then the chemotherapy is actually dropped out. If patients are hormonally driven, in addition to being HER2 driven, we often add endocrine therapy at that point but we almost universally continue the patient on trastuzumab and pertuzumab, and a lot of patients can be on that for more than a year, sometimes years. Then at the time of progression, TDM1 has really been our standard second line regimen. Patients do very well with this. It's an antibody drug conjugate. So again, this is chemotherapy that's bound to the antibody to Herceptin. So I liken this as the smart bomb. Uh, we infuse this into the patient's bloodstream and it really travels around not doing much to the normal cells. And then when it finds its target, that HER2, the trastuzumab binds and it releases its chemotherapy right on the cell. It's well tolerated for patients because there's no what I call naked chemotherapy there. So it tends to have very low rates of nausea, lower rates of hair loss, et cetera. The biggest side effects with TDM1 uh, are thrombocytopenia or low platelets. And oftentimes we have to watch the liver function tests as well.